you'll meet the human equivalent of a fireworks display when he's not lighting up the screen with electric performances in vehicles such as Stand and Deliver, Miami Vice, and American Me. He's hard at work as one of this country's most civic-minded citizens. Edward James Olmos is here, coming straight up on Straightforward. Some people gravitate toward community service with a vengeance that others apply to winning a lawsuit or hitting a baseball. That kind of devotion belongs to Edward James Almost, who spends more time in service to other Americans than he does on his own thriving career as an actor, director, and writer. Welcome and happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July to you too, Roger. <laughs> Happy birthday, America. <laughs> Happy birthday, America. What, what do you remember about Fourth of July when you were a kid? Was it a big day with sparklers, firecrackers, or what did you guys do? The biggest. Really? It was the biggest. It's yeah. one of the biggest holidays that I remember as a child. Yeah. It was colorful because uh, we all, all the family would get together. And, of course, my mother would, uh, and my, oh, all, the, all the adults would uh, have the most fun because they got to do the fireworks that they did get. Yeah. So, you know, they tried to make it calm and sane. As we got older, it got a little bit more fun because we would end up uh, doing the fireworks ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did loved you, it. What, <clears throat> when was it that you knew what the 4th of July was all about? Anybody ever explain it? I don't, I'm trying to remember my own childhood. I think we just thought it was about fireworks and stuff, and then finally we came around to realizing it was America's birthday, but it, it took a while. Yeah, we, we were, um, almost all of the adults in our family uh, have been in the armed services, so. So it was a big day for those. It was a big yeah. day. It's a big day for uh, all Americans, but especially the veterans. Yeah. You know, and, and my uh, stepfather had been in the war, and so it was a, always a, a wonderful experience. Do you think most Americans realize how hard we had to fight to make this country free? I think they do. I think the people, um, the majority of the people in this country, I think, really appreciate everything that uh, America stands for. And that's one of the things that uh, happens once in a while. You get a, an opportunity to uh, listen to the negative, but uh, very seldom do you get to hear the positive. There's a lot of great people who are really appreciative uh, of exactly what America stands for. Tell me about your family. How'd you grow up? You grew up in East LA, I guess. Yeah, I was born and raised in East Los Angeles in 1947. I was a post-Second uh, World War baby. And uh, I was born in the first, Japan the first uh, Japanese hospital in Los Angeles after really? the war. Hmm. Yeah, the first one ever built in... in, in uh... Well, there's a picture of you looking a little... <laughs> oh, Jesus. Hey, you look a little uh, This is there. a surprise hey, here, here, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where they got that picture. <laughs> oh, At boy. first I thought it was me, but then I realized it was you. All babies sort of look like baked potatoes, you know, for about the first six months. They all look the same, don't they? they... It was most unusual because, like uh, I was saying... Um, I didn't know how unusual until I went to visit my uh, doctor, who was uh, about four years ago. I went to go visit her, who had been my doctor, and she uh, told me a little bit of our story. She was 91 years old when I went to visit her four years ago, wow. and uh, Dr. Ichioka, and um, she's retired, and uh, she was in the uh, the camps during the Second World War. The uh, detention camps on the West Coast that mm -hmm. uh, we set up. Yeah and uh, most unusual lady, very strong lady. And uh, to be a woman, to be Japanese, to be a doctor during that period of time was an extraordinary experience. So I was brought into this in a very extraordinary way. My mother is a, a great lady, one of the great ladies. And Tell me about your mom. Oof. Right now, uh, on this 4th of July, she's at the, um, <laughs> she's at the uh, Los Angeles County General Hospital. She works in the AIDS ward from 11 o'clock at night till 7 o'clock in the morning, six days a week, and she's been doing it for years. And uh, she holds the hands of people who are passing on into the next understanding. That's her real main understanding. That's what she does. Wow. That yeah. is something, huh? She really set a high standard of understanding of, of what you know this life is all about. Uh, I have a 51-year-old brother, and I have a 12-year-old brother. So you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to have to think, think that through, but yeah. that's, that's interesting. My mother walked into the hospital one day, and a, and a child was being given away, literally, into adoption. And she said, this can't go on like this. And uh, she just took it. And they gave it to her in an emergency hospital in the L.A. County Emergency Hospital. They just, it's real, really, it's a different kind of a, of a life. And um, that child is very happy. My little brother is a wonderful, wonderful boy. Does he know you're a big star, or does he just oh, see you as he? Sure, I mean, big brother. <laughs> I'm his big brother. 
you know yeah. I'm his big brother and uh, uh, my mom's uh, a great lady you know is that where you got your uh, commitment to public service I know that you spend an awful lot of time on that sort of thing and and you wonder what drives a guy to do that. I mean, we all like to think we're charitable. We all like to think that we would give of our money or give of our time. But I mean, you've really put a lot into it. Where does that come from? A sense of what? I think that you hit it. I think that uh, you, you you definitely learn the behavior in which you deal with in your life, and it's something that uh, I learned from my parents and my grandparents. And uh, it's just an. I don't see. I'm so. Uh, overwhelmed when people say, geez, you do so much. Uh, I know so many people that do m so much more than I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I must say that uh, it's all, you know, again, uh, I'm very grateful. People ask me why you do this. Why do you do so much of this work for free and, and you go out in the community? I say because I've been very fortunate. I have a wonderful family. I have, I'm very, very healthy. Uh, my children are healthy. Uh, and, um, the more you give, the more you receive. But there's a line in Hollywood. I mean, there are a lot of Hollywood stars who, whose PR firm says, you know, you ought to be in favor of something and wear a ribbon or do this because, you know, we can get you a little press on this if you do it. And then there are guys who actually do it, who, who, who do things. I mean, I had John Denver here the other night, and I don't agree with John on some of his environmental stands, but I, I believe that he's truly committed to... To, to his environmental positions, his uh, commitment to restore or maintain the wilderness, and so on. And he really spends some time and effort on that, in that, in that, as opposed to just somebody who announces he's for a charity. Is there a lot of that in, in our world where people are kind of doing it as a cheap publicity stunt as opposed to really doing it? I wouldn't know. The people that, that I've been able to uh, understand and I, that I really am very grateful for have all been people that have given themselves beyond the call of duty. Most of them don't even ask for the publicity, nor do they want the publicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is really the key. You know, were you shy as a kid? You strike me as maybe you were shy yeah, as a I kid. Was. Were yeah, you? I, I, as a teenager? Yeah. Yeah. I, had to, to, I took my first uh, acting class was in college at the age of 17, and the uh, reason was, uh, at the time, uh, oh boy. <laughs> I don't know where they got these, but I'll tell you. <laughs> they called my mother, that's what that's they did. That's what they did, they called your mother. Yeah, my mother's the only one that has those kind of pictures, yeah. so uh, I, I wanted to talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> she's not working enough hours at that hospital. She has one more night she could give them where she's not hunting up pictures. But I, I, I bet she's up. proud of you, though. That's the reason she sends these pictures, because from the time you were a little boy, she probably showed people the pictures, am I right? My brothers and sisters all got the same treatment. Yeah. Yes, we all got my mother, like any mother, she's yeah. very proud of her family. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, you were telling me about not going into acting until college, or? Something. Yeah, I didn't. I, I was, um, I have a, a form of dyslexia, and I didn't know it at the time and when I was in school, not until I got, actually, I had my own children, and my children were diagnosed with it. And I said, well, that kind of happens to me. And she goes, well, they, they get, you probably gave it to them. Transposing Genetic. letters and figures and stuff. Yeah, short-term memory mm -hmm. loss. Uh, and there's a couple of things. Reading disability, you know, trying to, uh, I would read in a very stagnant way. It was mm -hmm. a very mon monotone and very precise way. And uh, it was very difficult. So I took a, a, the acting class to help me get past that kind of a feeling and that teacher uh, changed my life. He, they got me on a routine of, of reading the newspaper, quiet, uh, reading it in a private place for 10 minutes a day, hmm. seven days a week. That helped? Yeah, I, I still do it. I still read out loud every day. Uh, you know, I found throughout my life that people who have had some kind of difficulty to overcome, something to really overcome, hmm. often physical, emotional, family, mm -hmm. There are two kinds of people. They either rise to the occasion and meet the challenge and become stronger, often famous, interestingly enough, hmm. uh, people. Is that, is that true? Because did you feel you had to overcome that? Well, yeah. At the time, I didn't know I had it. So at the time, I was on like an uphill battle. I, I would study really hard in school, and, and I would only get C's. And it was really difficult for me because I felt like, well, they used to use two words on us. One word that they would use on, on students like myself were uh, they were just not trying hard enough. Right, yeah. Okay, a little lazy maybe. And yet, you know, I was really trying hard. The second one was, uh, and was the hardest, is that they were just dumb. You know, they were incapable of handling the material. Were you and ever called dumb? I'm sure, yeah. Well, I mean, not to my face, mm -hmm. 
but I'm sure they used it a lot because it's kind of embarrassing when you you know you're in school and you and you try hard and no one knows how hard you try because you you're kind of doing it by yourself. Ed, I got to take a break here in five seconds. We're going to come back with Edward James Olmos. You stay with us. We've got a fascinating show tonight. This guy is a terrific guy. Stay here. Y equal to ln quantity x minus one. What's the domain? X is greater than minus one. <laughs> no, to the end of the line. I've been gone two days and you forget already. What's the domain? All real numbers greater than one. X is greater than one. I told you you could do it. Okay, come on, sucky. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the role of Jaime Escalante in uh, Stand and Deliver. That was fantastic. What, what a, a man. Great movie. What a great, great man. Yeah. And he's the what I would consider to be the norm. In, in school teachers. Really? Yeah, as I went across the country, everybody say, well, that's the exception. I said, no, I've been out there. I really have seen that the norm, people today who are teaching in the public school systems of America, who are really there, are not there for fame or fortune. They are there just strictly because they have a calling in that situation. And I really bless people who are grammar school and, and, and junior, you know, grammar school and, and uh, preschool teachers. You know, that's really where it's all about. That's a tough, uh, tough, tough job. And they're not, when they're good teachers, they're sure not paid enough. I mean, I... No, our teaching I, uh, systems are not paid enough, no matter what level you jump into. Let me go back, because we were talking about overcoming problems and tragedies. And um, I, I've, I've been interested in a couple of different issues, well, a lot of issues over the years. But two that this country have has that, that are very difficult are the race question, the... the, the, mm -hmm. the racial tension in our country, which I think we have to solve or the country will eventually become unglued. And the and the and this is less racial and more about poverty, but the inner city or the or the people who really don't have any leg up. Is there any way to connect what people with handicaps often do, which is to directly overcome it? They take on their toughest channel challenge and overcome it. Is there any way to challenge these kids and say, look, you got a bad break. This is tough. You're in a tough spot, but only you can get out of it. And try to challenge them out of it in that way. Can they? Can you tap into something in the person that will force them to overcome their weakness? It's hard to say whether there is a uh, a formula or a way of doing that. All one can do is is put that feeling out there. Like what you just did right now is phenomenal. What you've just done right now is that you've even posed the question. By posing the question, every listener that's listening to us throughout the country that will see this, millions of people, will end up thinking about that question and how they will participate in that feeling of that question. And uh, the, the answer to that is, uh, I found my answer to try to understand that, uh, this problem that I see that's, that has grown with, and evolved like uh, everything, everything is evolving uh, and changing. That problem has evolved and changed. And that problem of motivating young children to get outside of what they feel they can't get outside of and change their lives for the better and become strong and healthy. And uh, by I've done it by way of just allowing myself to go into schools for free. I go to schools, uh, I've never been paid to go to a junior high grammar school, high school in my life. Just recently, in the last three years, have I paid to be, go to colleges. Well, yeah, they finally, I finally go, oh, you mean you got stipends here? Oh, yeah, they great. got money. They got, a, they <laughs> great, got a little great. cash. And if they don't, about, if it doesn't go to you, it goes for the beer, so you might as well. Well, what I do is I take the money that I get from a college and I'll go into the communities where they don't have any money at all. I'll, that, that money will help yeah, me get around. Yeah, it around a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it helps me to get around. And all I do when I get there is I talk and I allow them to ask me questions. And now granted that my celebrityness has gotten me to a point people say well people would like to hear you talk and say something but that isn't true that isn't true I started this 23 years ago long before you know there was any celebrity nest to who I am and what I am matter of fact it has helped me gain the strength to become the character that I am today right. is because of the, the amount of time that I spend in the, in the communities giving of myself. But what I found was when I walked into the very first school that I ever walked into, I remember the, the teacher, why they brought me in there. They had brought me in because I was a person of color who had been working in a field that their students had no awareness of because no one ever comes to their school and talks about that situation. And I said, well, don't you want somebody that's successful? Because I was doing a play in an off-off L.A. theater. 
I was at the Cellar Theater in Los Angeles, which is a small little theater. The year was 1972. And I was in this little theater, and this high school teacher says, come to my school and talk at my school. I like to, I go, well, why me? I mean, <laughs> why don't you go over and ask somebody that's somebody? They said, no, no, no. We don't want somebody that is successful. We want somebody that's in the struggle. And it clicked. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, how unusual. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, I'll come. And I went. I was embarrassed. What was I doing there? I didn't know what I was going to talk about. I just stood up there and I said, listen, I'm an actor and I come from here and uh, I've been doing this and I'm nobody, but here I am and I'm here. So your teacher wanted me to come here and guess what? I'm what you call a struggling artist. So ask me any questions you want. And that's how it started, just off the wall. And from that moment on, I spent 45 minutes there. About a week later, another teacher in that school asked me to come and do the same thing, and the rest is history. Now I average maybe, I'd say about 150 days out of the year, I'll be in a school talking. Is that right? Yeah. Boy, that's a lot. Yeah, about half the school. Half I the heard year. you give a speech, or saw, or saw a clip or something, where you said you were an African American. Most people, or had African American ancestry, that mm -hmm. you, that you, most people assume you're Hispanic of some. Yeah, well, I'm, um, <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful. You have one minute to break, but go ahead, take Here the whole go. minute. Here we go. I'm Mexican. You're Mexican. Okay. Mexican is um, Mexica, uh, Mayan, Aztec, indigenous. Okay, that's my root. Right. Um, I came together with my white blood uh, from Spain and Europe in the 500 years ago. And before that, I was indigenous to this continent for 11,000. My family has been here for 11,700 years. 11,700 years. They came from Asia. Before they were, they were in Asia. They came from Africa. So I come from Africa by way of Asia, Asia to the U.S., I mean into the Americas, into the Americas, and impregnated by the mixture of the white bloods, which makes the brownness. I'm from Ohio, and <laughs> my family fooled around a lot, but they sort of stayed amongst themselves, I guess. I'll be right back. Talking with actor, director, writer, composer Eddie James in the Pacific Ocean. I remember that. Didn't that do, wasn't that you were a singer with a group called yes, Eddie James in the Pacific Ocean? 1960, right? we started singing professionally really? on the Sunset Strip. It was so much fun. Oh, that's that was wild. A, one of some of the best years of my life. I put myself to college. Is that right? Singing, yeah. Those Rock were the years band. that Sonny and Cher were sort of wandering around the strip. Yeah. And, you know, oh, everybody was. Little hippie wandering around out there. And was, I tell you, we used to go in this little club and watch Bob Dylan play, you know, yeah. with the birds. And yeah. this is long before he was. Yeah, uh, I was out there in the 60s. You know, remember the Hamburger Heaven there right on the strip? But, uh, sure, yeah. Hamburger Hamlet. Oh, yeah. Well, it was Heaven in those days. Was it really? Yeah. Hamburger <laughs> oh, Heaven. Yeah, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, I love that character in Miami Vice, Vice because he's so depressed. That no matter how depressed I got, he was he more. was more depressed than me. I thought. And Thank so you really for, made for me even bringing it up. You know that nobody's ever brought it up. Really? In, in all the years that that character was on the air, no one ever brought up the fact that he was depressed. He was seriously depressed, seriously and it depressed. was a great character because so many people in America suffer from depression. Mm -hmm. Here was a guy functioning in a world he had to function in. That's right. He knew he had a job to do. That's right. He was near suicide himself by the by the vocal tone and from the right? get go. From the get go, this guy was a complete. This basket is when case. he put. He was. He 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 hated it. He hated what was going on out there in the streets, and he hated exactly what he had learned about his own life. Right. He had been a very strong advocate of of, of understanding law enforcement and the DEA, and during the time when he was in Vietnam. Uh, try, finding in the Golden Triangle years before he was a, a cop, became a normal cop in, in, in Miami. Um, he was brought down by uh, a high, the CIA had to, to turn them over, his whole group over, be, for a larger perspective. They had to uh, sacrifice, sacrifice, for, them. sacrifice them for something bigger. And he, lo he thought he had lost his wife and his child and everybody. Right. I, I, I thought it was a magnificent characterization, and as I look through television history over the last 40 years, that character does stay in my mind as one of the characters that, that was so definitive. And pe most people missed it. I mean, they, they, they were watching Don Johnson and they running around with no socks on and the new coat and everything. I used to and get hate mail. You they, got hate they mail? Thought, yeah, they thought that I didn't like Don and Philip. Right. And 
<laughs> no, no, it was not about them. It was uh, this guy this was guy just was, a basket case. You, uh, you never knew. Pain. I kept expecting an episode where the guy takes the gun out of his drawer and says, "That's it." Well, a couple of times he went in over way over his head, mm -hmm. you know, and a couple of times he did. In Bushido, he went way over his head, oh. and he okay. tried to save the life of his best friend's uh, wife, who was a KGB agent, and that was way beyond. Right, he was right. CIA and KGB agents who had fallen right. in love with each other during a time period, and they had had the child, and they called him Marty, same name as as Martin Castillo, and it was a tragic, tragic episode. It was. <clears throat> what's interesting about that is that that I don't think law enforcement officers get enough credit, in my mind, for the work they do. It's a. It is a terrible, terrible job. Now there I are praise. some that are way over the line, and. There are some that, you know, do things, but I'll tell you something, having to go out there every day and put your life on the line like that and, 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 and face down some bozo, you know, and you can't shoot first. I mean, the I could not respect. be a police officer because I would kill 63 people a day. I mean, just if anybody looked like they were going to pull a gun, I'd just shoot because you, can't, you don't know who's out there. I mean, these <laughs> people are God crazy. Christ, Aren't you happy I'm not out there oh, on the streets? I'm so glad you're I couldn't, not there. I couldn't do that, job. I couldn't sit there and watch a guy reach in his coat and I'd say, I well, I have to, internal affairs says I have to wait till he shoots me before I do anything. My mother worked for the uh, sheriff's department for nine years, and uh, I have up due respect for law enforcement. Yeah. And it's the highest, one of the highest. Uh, you know, integrity-filled jobs that one could do service to, public service to. to what have you not people. done as an actor that you would like to do? A comedy. You know, that's <laughs> great. Nobody would think of you. You know what happened was you, when you were in Miami Vice, that guy was so depressed, that yeah, role you played, that they don't pick you for comedies, I bet. Uh, it's very interesting because I thought that... that you have a great smile, by the way. I, thought, the standard, I never smiled once on that program. Do you know that? No, but it doesn't surprise me because whenever I saw it, yeah, you were always. I always said, you know, I feel depressed. I think I watch him, <laughs> yeah. and then I'd feel a lot better. I'd say this guy is really depressed, you know. So well, I'll tell you, I, would, I, I thought in, in Stand and Deliver, you know, that would have kind of like clicked something off that people yeah, would just to recognize say, well, your ability in comedy. comedy. Yeah, you but know what's I'm funny is that I see it in your eyes and I see it in your smile. I mean, you, but. You know, all uh, the, the comedy flip side of all tragedy is funny. comedy. Huh? Okay, comedy is not being funny. Right. Comedy is situation. That's right. So, you know, you put a face like mine in a situation that's pretty funny. It could become very <laughs> funny, I think, you know. I think they did that well in, with, uh, uh, in some of the uh, uh, airplane movies and stuff like that. They would get very, very solid actors and put right. them in very incredible situations, like Lloyd Bridges and, and you know, right. and, and, you know, it was wonderful. I loved it. It's a great character it. actor named Austin Pendleton. I don't know if you know Austin, but he was in, uh, uh, he's been in a lot of things from Catch-22 to, to, to and, and he was in uh, Pretty Woman, but he always plays the part, he was the desk clerk in Pretty Woman, and he looks serious all the time, mm -hmm. but he is funny because he plays serious in a situation, and it's counter to what's actually happening, and Austin's a good friend. He comes from my hometown, so, and he's been a guest on the show, but He's, he's sort of, you see him in every movie and somewhere mm -hmm. doing just about a minute of great stuff. You uh -huh. know? It's, just, it's just wonderful when you see it. Um, you were shooting a movie here in New York, or are shooting a movie? Is that why you're here in town? Yes. What We've are you been working on? working uh, on a thing called Into It, which is a very, very strong and, and passionate film. Uh, it's a cross between Moonstruck and uh, Postman Always Rings Twice. It's about a family where a stranger comes in and changes all of their lives. And uh, it's about uh, coming to terms with those changes. And uh, it's a very, very tough family film. At the same time, family meaning a, about a family. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a film that uh, the filmmaker has wanted to make for almost 25 years. Maria Conchita Alonso. Alonso. Yeah, yeah, Maria. She was here it. about a couple of weeks ago. She was here because she's in Spider Woman on Broadway. She <laughs> yes, she is. She's a funny lady. Yes, she is. You she's know? a great talent. She's like. Uh, she sings, dances, and acts. Or, you know. You know she's, she is really funny. She told us that she likes men's rear ends the best. I mean, that was one of her things. I said, What do you find a sexy about a guy? And she says, They're behind. That was, that was her contribution to culture here at America's Talking. Um, Maria Conchita, you, we'd like to have you back to explore other options. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tony Garofalo, my producer, said you had to do a heart attack scene. Was that today or? Today. What'd you do? Yeah. Um, it was pretty intense. Have you ever, you've never had a heart I've never had an experience one. I've done How'd one you know how to attack. act one? How do you know well, how to We brought a, a, um, a specialist, a uh, 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 heart specialist in for three hours yesterday before we, 
right when we started the scene, and um, he stayed with me and, and told me exactly what would happen. So you and, and so you grab your chest. Through, yeah, we'll go through the whole process. Yeah, it's pretty intense, and, and needless to say, most people do not die. Uh, at the site. No, if they get them to the doctor, but then mm, at 24 hours. 24 hours. Okay. It's mainly a pain. It's like you know, like anything else, you feel short-winded and you get pain. In this case, this this attack is so it's a grand, you know, grand mal, almost like a grand mal attack. It's uh, mm -hmm. very intense and it does kill them. Hmm. So I just gave away a lot of the movie. Well, you just okay. gave away the movie. <laughs> Instead of the movie, I think I'll intrigue you. Uh, I want to go back to comedy because have you ever done comedy in theater? I know mm -hmm. you worked in little theater and uh, oh yeah, in theater we did a lot of comedy. It was wonderful. It was yeah. that's what we bit our teeth into. It was actually doing theater of the absurd. That's what we yeah. called it. Um, yeah. And in the early '60s, when we were doing this, uh, in middle '60s, um, it was wonderful. It was just it was the best way to cut your teeth. And I did theater for up until 1982. And that's all I did. I produced Hot El Baltimore off Broadway in '73 down at the Circle in the Square, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a tragic situation. But there's a lot of humor in the in the situation if you know the play Hot El Baltimore. It's a Lanford mm -hmm. Wilson play. I know the play. And uh, and Judd Hirsch, I think, was the was the desk clerk at that time when we first did it. And uh, and, and it's a funny play. And then they moved it to com they moved it to television as a com as a sitcom, but it won't play that way because it's an American tragedy. These people were tragic figures. But in their tragedy, they found humor. That's what was really interesting about it. Tell me about your current marriage. Uh, your, your wife is a very attractive uh, actress. Yes, she's a great lady, Lorraine Bracco. She's a great lady. And I'm very, very fortunate. We've been dating for about five years. Have you? Yeah, and we got married uh, about a year and a half ago. How's marriage working out? Very well. Does it? Very well, yeah. We, we explore that on this <clears> show <throat> because two of my staff members are getting married within the next three months. I've done everything I can to discourage this. Oh, because I figure that if they can... If there's, yeah, because there's young Melissa over here as one. Uh, if the reason is because if I can't discourage them, then they really want to get married, and then it may work, right? But if you Are go you in half-heartedly, well, I've sort of been through it a couple times. That's the point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Today is the birthday of our country. It's the birthday of uh, this network, also America's Talking, and each show on this network is honoring a person whose work in the communities of America has made a difference, and everyone at Straightforward agrees, and that's why we're honoring this man tonight. We're going to do it officially when we come back with our honoree, Edward James Olmos, right after these messages. There's so many things I'd like to talk to you about, but because it's America's birthday, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the way the country's going right now? <clears throat> Optimistic because of uh, the youth of this country. We have uh, some of the worst violence that we've ever had coming from our youth, and that's just an extension of, uh, of a behavior that's been taught to them. People have to realize that violence is a learned behavior and that uh, it is not a judicial problem, it is a health problem. And we have to start really dealing with that health problem. And, but because of the 92 to 94 percent the children that don't get into problems that are even though they're poor or even though they're whatever they don't get into problems but they go on to be good citizens we never acknowledge that we just acknowledge the six or seven percent of the children that are into a very very difficult time we do have an extraordinary problem in this country and that's children killing children for no reason does does the movie industry and television take some blame or not i mean there's been a lot of controversy oh, on think, that i think that uh, a lot of the artistry of the world uh, take responsibility for what they project and what they do with themselves, whether they be writers, or they be uh, filmmakers, or they be mm -hmm. television people, whatever. But uh, the media definitely has to balance itself out. Balance is the key, and that we're not in balance yet. We still have a strong desire to see negative images on the screen. That's the viewer. The viewer would rather go see Rambo or Terminator than go see Stand and Deliver. That was proven. We proved it. Yeah. Does that, what's that say about us as a people? The, it's disappointing. You tell me. Well, you know. <laughs> I, I, I wonder that about that. About I guess uh, I, I really don't know. I mean, I think that it must have some influence on some people. My guess is that the ones who are sick, it makes worse, as opposed to the ones who are well, it makes do something they wouldn't ordinarily do. 
but uh, it attacks the subconscious mind when you're using the uh, the large screen. Right. When you use the cinema, I'm not kidding you. When yeah, you boy, the, you go in there. That, it's all it's all over. It's all encompassing. Yeah. People say, "Well, look at." I'm, I'm a, an adult, I can see these things, mm -hmm. I use my conscious mind, I know good and evil. That's great until you realize that your subconscious mind, which is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week and never stops, has no morals, has no uh, right. aesthetics. It has nothing but a way to record th information play, and play, play, back. play back for Then you. the conscious mind is supposed to be able to decipher that. Okay, I want to make a presentation to you, but before I make <clears> this <throat> presentation, I'd, I'd just like to say that to me, patriotism is made up of many things. One is your contribution to your fellow Americans or fellow man. In fact, great Americans often put less emphasis on acquiring things and more on contributing to others. My guest tonight has certainly done that by his contributions, and he is a great American. So on this day of celebration, when our country is 219 years old, America's talking is one year old, uh, I'm 37 years old, but that's irrelevant. No, I'm not. I'm much older than that. Uh, anyway, Ed, I'd like to take this occasion to recognize you with an award we plan to make at a, uh, an annual event here at America's Talking. It's our Great Americans Award. We know that your devotion to the public good started long before you became a celebrity. This acknowledgement is our way of thanking you for your outstanding efforts on behalf of all Americans. There you are. God bless Thank you. you. Let's hear a little applause here for Mike Fruit. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very you. much, Ed, and keep up the good work and all the good works. And say hello to your mom. I will. Okay. <laughs> you can say hello to your mom right Hi, there. Hi, Mom. Okay. When we come back, the diva of cabaret, Ann Hampton Calloway, will be with us. Uh, so you stay right where you are. You are going to hear something that is unbelievable. She is really good.